Greetings and salutations, fans of esports, fans of StarCraft 2, and most importantly, potential fans of StarCraft 2. This is your host, The Mad Bag, and today I'm going to be bringing you the first episode of a special new video series. This brief introductory episode is going to take a look at the mere surface of StarCraft 2. I'm going to describe the real-time strategy genre, give examples of how real-time strategy games are played, and detail how StarCraft II stands out from its peers. Now that the groundwork has been laid, let's take a look at the genre as a whole. Real-time strategy games almost exclusively use a bird's-eye view to display an environment where the strengths and weaknesses of differing forces are used to measure the skill of two opponents. What that means as a player of a real-time strategy game is that you get to choose the nature of the forces you control in battle, and that you are expected to learn the strengths and weaknesses of those forces so that you can use them to their maximum efficiency against your opponent who's doing the same. The types of actions you take in a real-time strategy game as a player can be separated into two major categories. One is micromanagement, and the other is macromanagement. Macro allows you to control the types of forces you field, and micro allows you to control the effect and the impact those forces have. To give a StarCraft II example of each of these, as the game's human race, you perform a macro action when you create a barracks, and when you tell the barracks to produce a marine, you perform a micro action when you select that marine and march him across the map to attack your opponent. The micro-macro concept is one that exists in nearly all real-time strategy games. A game like Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War, for example, has very low emphasis on macro play and very high emphasis on micro play by automating a lot of macro tasks like acquiring resources and by uh, making more complex a lot of micro tasks. Dawn of War uses a lot of squad based combat and each squad has multiple different things that it can do and you tend to use a lot of different types of squads. So you spend a lot of time in the game microing your, your forces and not a lot of time macroing your base and whatnot. StarCraft has uh, almost a perfect balance between the two. That narrow balance is stricken primarily by the componential production system that StarCraft 2 uses. All real-time strategy games require that you build units to field against your opponent. In most real-time strategy games, that production occurs in a single queue, where you select a unit to build, you begin building it, when it's finished, the next one starts. StarCraft II does not use a system like that. Instead, in StarCraft II, you produce a unit off each building that can produce units, aka the Terran Barracks. Uh, you can build a number of barracks. Each one can individually produce its own marine. Therefore, if you increase your economy and are able to produce more units, you simply add more production facilities to produce those units. And then you have to begin queuing units on those additional production facilities, which is a macro action that you perform in the game. StarCraft II's Componential Production allows you to very easily scale the number of units you're producing, and so the amount of resources you're spending on producing units, to the level of your income, which is also very Componential. Income is generated using a command structure and a number of workers who mine a mineral patch or Vespian geyser. Each command structure can field a number of workers that you build one at a time. You can also field additional command structures to build workers more quickly and to harvest resources remotely located. StarCraft II differs from its real-time strategy peers by virtue of resources. Many real-time strategy games have multiple resources, but none quite so meticulously balanced as StarCraft's Minerals and Vespian Gas. The first, minerals, is very basic. You can mine it with your workers the second you have any. Minerals are used in whole or in part for everything that you can purchase in the game. Vespian gas is a bit more complex. You have to create a structure on a Vespian geyser to even mine it. Once mined, it's primarily used on upgrades or any sort of tech structure or unit. 
upgrades also have some unique features in StarCraft II. They come in two categories. The first being upgrades that allow your units to use a new ability or that change their statistics directly, like the Marine's Combat Shield or the Marine's Stim upgrade. The second category are upgrades that apply in mass to different unit types that increase their base armor or weapon damage. Uh, these upgrades in the game have three different levels and so uh, allow you to continuously throughout the course of a game power up all of your forces. And so we come full circle to controlling your forces. Now micromanagement is very deep in StarCraft 2 and has a number of different various aspects. Everything from giving your forces simple commands to being aware of pathing and AI nuances and abusing those to your benefit. I can't provide a real good understanding of micromanagement until I actually delve right into the details. So this episode's going to be a little short. Again, this is an introductory episode. Uh, however, some of my future episodes will go into very granular detail on different aspects of microcontrol for all of the three races. Three races? What? Yes, I repeat, there are three different races that you can choose in StarCraft II, each very diverse. Uh, as a real-time strategy game, StarCraft II is known for the diversity in all aspects of its gameplay, and races is where a majority of that diversity comes from. The first of the three races, the Terrans, are the most human-like race. Now, in StarCraft lore, Earth does exist, and the humans ultimately are from Earth. However, the humans that you play as the Terrans in the game are a sect of convicts who were banished through a wormhole. Uh, they then found the other two races in the game, two alien races, and uh, locked themselves in eternal conflict. Now, aside from the lore, the Terran forces are uh, very reliant on ranged attacks. This means that a lot of their units have uh, comparably lower hit point values, um, decent damage, about equal damage values to a lot of the other races' units, but they have range so they can begin engaging the enemy sooner, whereas there are a lot of melee units on the other two, uh, the other two races, the Zerg and the Protoss. The Terrans also have a few very powerful but slow ground units that in certain matchups make them feel very immobile. That immobility can and is often abused by the faster units of the other two races. Terrans' ponderous and momentum-based production are complemented by a strength the Terrans have in economy. They have a unit the Orbital Command and the Mule that allow them to mine resources faster than the other two races. The Zerg race is a conglomerate of mutated species from an array of different planets. The Zerg race itself is just a strain of infectious DNA that changes its host to serve the hive mind. Aesthetically, they look like a cross between the aliens from Ridley Scott's uh, early 90s, or I guess late 80s, early 90s movies, uh, mixed with the arachnids from Starship Troopers. Stylistically, the Zerg units are very cheap and so very easily massed. Because they're cheap and because Zerg tend to have a lot of them, they are also weaker than the other races. The way the Zerg race produces units allows them to uniquely dedicate all of their production to any one type of unit meaning that if they so desire, they can produce economy faster than either of the other two races, or they can switch and produce army faster than either of the other two races. They can't, however, do both simultaneously. Many Zerg units have rather fast movement speeds, allowing them to cover great distances very easily, making counterattacks a key part of their style. And uh, this is also conducive to their mass expansion, which just generally works good for massing up units and overwhelming your opponent. The Protoss are a technologically advanced race of basically space elves. Uh, they are psionic, they do not speak vocally, but they speak using telepathy, and uh, they have a lot of plasma and laser-based weaponry. Pew pew pew! In sticking with the alien versus predator theme, Protoss would be the predators. 
Stylistically, the Protoss have a number of technologies and units that allow you to perform some very technical aspects of strategy. For example, the Protoss Warp Gate can warp in units anywhere that you have what's called pylon power. This allows the Protoss to establish a forward base and then reinforce very quickly, whereas Terran and Zerg would have to produce their units at their main base and rally them to the front, wait for the units to cross the map, and then begin their assault. Compositionally, the Protoss forces have a plethora of different types of units and methods of attack that include melee units, ranged units, uh, splash, AoE type units, siege, um, just really the full gamut. So you may get a giggle out of this. Uh, the somewhat poor editing throughout this video has taken me a really long time. I do plan future episodes, however this isn't something that's going to happen uh, on a real regular basis. It's not even going to be as soon as weekly. Um, the next episode will probably take me quite a while to get together and get out. However, I plan on covering the full list of things. I started very basic in this, and uh, I'm going to move on to exploring each of the races. Um, I'm probably going to start with really simple macro tasks, and then get into specifics of the races, and I'm going to break absolutely everything down. I'm going to show you uh, best practices for macro. I'm going to show you how to micro different groups of units, different compositions. I'm going to show you nuances and tips and tricks for how to micro certain units better, or certain situations better. Show the importance of harass. Occasionally break down numbers for uh, maximum efficiency of production on a number of bases, or maximum efficiency for mining on a number of bases. A, I, I really have a huge to-do list that I would like to do with this series, uh, but it's going to be a slow work in progress. So thanks for watching guys. If you liked the video, then be sure you let YouTube know. If you like my potential for future content, then you should subscribe. See you in the next episode.